I'm really interested in hearing uh, your take on uh, everything China's doing right now. They're, mm. <laughs> they're really well, shaking up. Yes. The US, making the U.S. look like... Uh, well, you let know. me give the <laughs> let me give the introduction, Harvey, and then you can ask that question. All okay. Right? <laughs> all right. So, all right. So today we have KJ. No, yes, he's back. Uh, KJ is a peace activist and scholar on the geopolitics of the Asian continent, who writes for LA Progressive, Counterpunch, and Dissident Voice. He's special correspondent for KPFA. Flashpoints on the pivot to Asia, the Koreas, and the Pacific. So, KJ, welcome back, and I'm going to get Harvey to ask you the first question. <laughs> well, I don't know that I've got it very well uh, articulated, but uh, it's just China's uh, profile globally now is just so remarkable what they're doing. And I just wanted to hear uh, how you view all that and uh, yeah. where do you think well, it goes from here? Well, I think we have to understand this as a long-term project. You oh, know, the yeah. Chinese are, are not new at this. What they have been doing is they have been building out what they call a community of common destiny. That is essentially the idea is that we on this planet are all on the same boat and we sink or swim together. That means that we have to cooperate together. There are, you know, critical, uh, you know, world changing circumstances that we're facing, not the least of which is global warming. So we have to work together. We have a common destiny. And so then what they propose is win, win cooperation and of course, mutual development, because still there are many countries in the global south where poverty and resources are a fundamental issue. So how can we work for mutual development, win-win cooperation? Mm -hmm. And all of that is put together in, you know, concretely, for example, in the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. and then in China's uh, policy proposals uh, that have to do with, you know, reasserting national sovereignty, territorial integrity, win-win uh, cooperation, the UN charter, uh, and non-interference. And so these are just some very fundamental concepts that really come out of the non-aligned movement uh, that Zhou Enlai uh, formulated. Uh, and this has been put together in what is called the Global Security Initiative, which is their plan for how do we get a peaceful and stable world where countries cooperate with each other. Well, there's some ground rules. We follow the UN Charter. We don't interfere. We don't wage aggressive war. We always look for dialogue and cooperation, and we understand security. A security is a fundamental right as much as any other human right. But security is a fundamental right. But that has to be understood intersubjectively. That is to say that your security cannot come at the expense of mine, but that it has to be a mutual uh, understanding and a mutual coordination. And once we start to think of security in this fashion, then we break out of the uh, American or Western European realist school of international relations, which always asserts individual security at the cost of another. And therefore, we run into a security dilemma. And this is always grounded in this kind of existential or epistemological blindness, where you have no idea what the other party is going to do to you, uh, there is no overarching order in the global system. Uh, all you can assume is that everybody is out for number one. And because of that, your only choice is to seek to either dominate or to be military, militarily uh, undominable. And that really you know, creates a spiral of escalation, the classical security dilemma, which you know, we have seen play out 
most recently in, you know, the Russia-Ukraine proxy war. And so I think the Chinese are putting together some really uh, profound foundational concepts, you know, to get the international uh, system back into order. Uh, I think it's very clear that at least for the past 30 years and probably at least, you know, since you know, the Treaty of Westphalia, the international system hasn't worked. It's essentially being might makes right. Mm -hmm. And the U.S., especially in the, you know, post-Cold War era, has simply steamrolled and abused and asserted its hegemony uh, in violent and brutal and unconscionable ways. And I think this Chinese approach, which is part of a larger movement towards pluripolarity or multipolarity is an attempt to balance that out and to build out some of the structures uh, that allow us to have a more equitable, peaceful, and stable world. So, and so, yes, sorry, sorry. And so most recently we've seen these, these developments applied between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's profound. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia has always been a proxy for Western interests, at least since 1915, since essentially going back to Lawrence of Arabia. It's been a proxy for U.S. imperial interests. Uh, it was tightly tied in with Standard Oil, uh, and it has always served as a counter-revolutionary bulwark against pan-Arab socialism. And, uh, and of course, you know, colonialism has always, you know, been predicated on this strategy of divide and conquer. And for China to mediate so that, you know, two enemies, Saudi and Arabia and Iran, which have always been used against each other, are able to reconcile and start to come together. I think that signals a sea shift. Uh, in uh, the Middle East, global affairs in the Middle East, and I think eventually for the larger world. I haven't seen anything, but have you seen anything specifically related to that agreement that China put together from the United States? I've not seen a United States reaction to that, but you know, I, I saw that and I thought that is <laughs> really surprising. Well, I mean, I've seen a little bit, but given how extraordinary it, it is, uh, the amount of attention that has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, devoted to it is minimal. I mean, I think that right now, I think in the halls of elite power, I think a lot of people are very, very panicked because, as I said, you know, this is a sea change in uh, global affairs. Uh, and, you know, Saudi Arabia is not simply a matter uh, of, you know, uh, you know uh, a reliable bulwark and ally against, you know, uh, liberation movements or pan-Arab liberation movements, socialist, pan-Arab socialism. But uh, it has, it is also the underpinning of the U.S. petrodollar, uh, mm -hmm. which is the foundation of the United States' exorbitant privilege, its privilege as the global reserve currency, which then uh, gives the U.S. this unlimited credit card with which to wage war. Petroleum is still the lifeblood of the international capitalist order. And as long as, you know, the petrodollar and the petro bourse is in, uh, in place, there is a constant demand for dollars. And therefore, countries can sell things to the United States. The U.S. essentially gets them for free, and then it just writes them an IOU, that is T-bills, or it prints dollars, and gives these other countries funny money and these countries just rack up uh, American debt. But what it does is it keeps uh, inflation low uh, in the United States and essentially gives the U.S. an unlimited credit card. Now, all of that is starting to unravel because first, the U.S. very foolishly, uh, you know, pushed uh, Russia out of this system 
and Russia is a petroleum producing country. And also it has, you know, very close ties to uh, most of the global South. And so that was the U.S.'s first mistake. In general, the U.S. has been overusing sanctions the way, uh, you know, a quack doctor prescribes antibiotics for everything until they don't work at all. Uh, and the third element of this is that as you, um, as you um, push uh, or as you, you, as you weaponize the dollar, uh, you give more and more incentive for people to de-dollarize, to get out of the dollar uh, and to shift into other currencies, other baskets of currencies. And we see that right now in that countries are shifting to what the BRICS call the six R's, that is, uh, you know, the Brazilian real, the Indian rupee, the Russian ruble, uh, the South African rand, the Chinese renminbi. Uh, and then it looks like it may also be joined by the Iranian uh, uh, real uh, and the Saudi uh, real. And so we're looking at the six or seven R's that are coming together, basket of currencies that creates an alternative uh, global reserve currency. And that is, you know, deeply uh, destabilizing for the United States. This is why we're starting to see uh, these impacts uh, in, uh, you know, in the U.S. economy. I mean, they've been building up for a while, but these bank bankruptcy, Silicon Valley Bank, and now uh, Credit Suisse and many others are at risk. This is tied to two key things. One is the U.S.'s financial war against Russia. Very, very foolish. And now we're seeing the blowback. But even before then, the U.S.'s financial war against China by uh, waging financial war against China and by trying to split the global economy, which is so deeply intertwined and so deeply dependent on China, by trying to cleave that uh, and to isolate China, uh, what they've essentially done. It's like you have conjoined twins uh, and you try and separate them by force and you forget that the, you know, that the, that the other twin has the heart and the brain. I mean, this is what's happening right now. Mm. Good Lord. I'm not an economist and all this dollar stuff is, you know, it, it just goes, right over my head but um uh that knowing the united states if things start to go down that rabbit hole the only way we respond is militarily we respond yeah. to everything militarily so yes. you know from that standpoint um how's how's u.s china relations not good uh u.s china relations are not good and they're getting worse by the day. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there is an incredible momentum. Uh, we see the hybrid war accelerating. And as I've said before, the hybrid war, you know, when the U.S. wages war, it doesn't simply wage kinetic war. It builds up to it with trade war, tech war, economic warfare, cultural warfare, social warfare, uh, academic warfare, information warfare, diplomatic warfare, and legal warfare, lawfare, all the time as it builds up to the military kinetic component. And we can see that constantly accelerating we see the momentum building and it's uh, i think it's kind of breakneck and head spinning how much uh, this is happening and uh, eli ratner who is you know seconded to the defense department says you will be even more surprised with even more surprises in store you know for you or for China. But, you know, just uh, just to kind of go over some key points, uh, post Trump, you know, uh, Trump accelerated, he shifted into second gear, you know, Obama had put the car into gear, Trump shifted it into second gear with some serious economic warfare. Uh, and then you see that Biden has shifted into third, he's continuing Trump's decoupling and adding 
you know, massive reshoring. So, you know, the attacks on Huawei and other Chinese firms, uh, sanctions have continued. They put through the CHIPS Act, which mm -hmm. is, again, an act of madness, but the idea that somehow that you can reshore the manufacture of semiconductors onto the United States and close China out of the semiconductor system. That's, that's an act of madness. It's not going to happen. But the U.S. is dead set on doing this. More recently, we saw the IRA, which is, uh, again, attempt to decouple China from, you know, the electric car market. Um, you know, the Obama had originally started out with a Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was to, you know, create an, uh, a, an a, a alignment of 12 countries in the Pacific uh, area and exclude China, if you can believe that, the you know, the madness of excluding China from a Pacific Economic Partnership. But uh, anyway, the U.S. is continuing down this road. You know, it looks like TikTok is next in line. And mm -hmm. once again, imagine if, you know, China had said to Facebook, you have to sell Facebook uh, to us. You know, you have to do it. I mean, right. we would be we would be in, in arms. I mean, it's one thing to say TikTok cannot, you know, uh, you know, cannot do its business here. I mean, that's, you know, that's a different set of questions. But to say that you have to sell it to us, I mean, that's just a completely different, uh, you know, ball game, And it just shows how extraordinarily desperate the United States. So coming back to this, you know, what I see is a break neck escalation to kinetic war and you're absolutely right you know uh, when the only thing you have left uh, you know is a hammer then you're going to start banging nails right everything looks like a nail the u.s no longer has economic parity with china because it financialized its economy and it offshored its industry because it was it did this for two things because it could create uh, super profits off of Chinese, cheap Chinese labor. It also was gambling that if it did this, it could also bring down the Chinese system, kind of corrupt it with capitalism and eventually, uh, you know, force, uh, force it into a situation like the Soviet Union where the Chinese would become either completely corrupt and capitalist uh, or they would fall to pieces because of their own, uh, you know, internal contradictions of a Potemkin state. It was partially a collapsis doctrine, and it was partially, you know, this regime change approach, and it was partially just, you know, let's steal as much, exploit as much as we can. And in this process, what it also did was it de-industrialized uh, its own economy, the U.S. economy, and it did mm -hmm. this because it, uh, by doing so, was able to discipline labor. That is to say, you know, your skilled uh, uh, blue collar worker all of a sudden found themselves with nothing and then had to settle for a job paying one fifth of what they were making. And so then that drives more desperation, uh, you know, more uh, frenzied economic activity uh, and then more profits for the ruling class. I mean, all of this was uh, very, very deliberate. But the one piece that didn't work out for the ruling elite was they expected China to either subjugate itself to the U.S. global system, because all countries have done that historically since 1945. Every time you economically uh, you know, go into a country, eventually these countries become subaltern, subordinate uh, parts of the U.S. controlled global capitalist system. And this is why, you know, only a handful of countries have ever broken out of colonialism to become developed. There are very, very few countries. All of them are still incredibly poor. China in 1980 was per capita, it was poorer than Haiti. Uh, and if it had continued uh, going down the U.S., what the U.S. designs, it would still be as poor as Haiti. It would just be a, a massive Haiti, but it's not, you know, it's, you know, it's hundreds of times wealthier than uh, Haiti and it has ended poverty. It has 
uh, increased its life. It's doubled its life expectancy. The life expectancy in China currently is longer than the United States. Maternal mortality is one half of the United States. I mean, it's just a country that goes from strength to strength to strength. And it also has the most popular government on the planet. 92% of the people support uh, the Chinese government, 92% of its citizens. And so what it did was something was kind of extraordinary was it broke out of this uh, imperial capitalist chokehold and it developed on its own terms. It said, we're going to develop, but we're not going to become subordinate or subaltern. Uh, we're not going to become capitalist, although we will borrow elements of a market economy in order to build out our productive forces in order to create wealth which we will then use to lift everybody up. Uh, and we will not uh, become westernized or Western liberal, which is always the you know, traditional assumption that in order for a country to modernize, it has to become westernized and capitalist. Chinese broke that mold. And in doing so, uh, they created, they broke ground or they broke the ice for other countries to do the same, so much so that they've actually created an alternative pole of development. I mean, this is the newly developing multipolar order. Mm -hmm. And because China is doing that, the US cannot tolerate that. And it's reaching into its arsenal. And it still has uh, a few quivers, uh, a few arrows left in its quiver. Uh, one of them is its extraordinary uh, military power. So that's what it's leaning on. Mm -hmm. And related to its military power, the U.S. still has an extraordinary strength in information warfare because it invented PR and advertising. It knows how to do uh, information warfare. It knows how to do propaganda. It's the most skilled propagandist on the planet. And so you see the constant demonization, uh, delegitimation, threat mongering against China, which it is using to build out its cause for war against China. And hence the daily, daily insult of lies and canards and misrepresentations and you know, just rancid, rancid uh, libel against China every single day. Uh, and then the third element, which it is still good at, is it's good at lawfare, legal warfare, because it's a country which is led by lawyers. It's, uh, uh, and so it is constantly trying to uh, undermine China through legal means, and it's constantly trying to assert a kind of extraterritorial judicial uh, warrant against China uh, uh, through, you know, through Congress and through its uh, legislative, uh, you know, institutions. So there's an extraordinary, extraordinary escalation. Uh, and I think that uh, we're in a very, very dangerous place. Because this could really, uh, I mean, all of these things that the United States seems to be doing and the propaganda, especially, um, uh, it you you look at the end game, and it's not good for the world. It's definitely not good for the United States, um, where they're pushing. So, uh, uh, another question. Well, obviously, since uh, last fall, since we talked, we're a lot closer to war, to actually a a shooting war now, than we were then. And we were on the edge of our seats then, so um, let's see what can what can we say here? Uh, what are the developments you've noticed between Asia, Korea, Japan, Philippines, Thailand, and I guess you can throw in um, AUKUS in there also. I mean, you know, bring bring the status in there, and and then we'll. I, I wanted to get your take on the Chinese propo peace proposal for Ukraine. But let, let's hear about the rest of Asia first. Well, yeah, I'll do that. But let me first um, comment on your statement about, you know, how dangerous it is uh, and how this can have no good end. Uh, I think we have to remember that the, the architect 
of the Cold War. Uh, I mean, of course, we have people like uh, Cannon and other Cold Warriors, but the ethical architect of the Cold War was a theologian called Reinhold Niebuhr. And Reinhold Niebuhr still has a huge effect or a huge influence on uh, U.S. foreign policy and the people who exercise it. And Niebuhr believed in the kind of baldest terms, in, in, in the simplest terms, uh, that it was better uh, to be dead than red, that you had to risk the end of the world, that you had to risk a nuclear war uh, in order to defeat the enemy. And of course, he was so deeply uh, you know, imbibed with the sense of U.S. supremacy and the value of, you know, the U.S. system, that he believed that it was necessary to risk nuclear war in order to preserve, quote unquote, this U.S. system and U.S. hegemony. Mm -hmm. uh, he believed that this was, you know, morally and ethically and theologically right. And I think that we still have those assumptions feeding uh, you know, the imperial ruling uh, power elite. This is how they think. So I believe that uh, they would rather see the end of the war, uh, end of the world, uh, than the end of their supremacy and hegemony. And so this is what makes things so dangerous. But, you know, coming back to what do I see concretely, as I said, I see more and more escalation. I see breakneck escalation. So you're seeing more actions, more exercises, more exercise, uh, you know, more training, you know, more alliances. Uh, you're seeing uh, just a, a torrent of information war, lies, threat mongering, you know, a weather balloon suddenly becomes, you know, an existential threat uh, to the United States. Uh, you know, your coffee maker, your your crane, your uh, refrigerator, your everything is spying on you because the Chinese are spying on you, this hyper paranoid thinking. And then also the other signal that I see, which is probably the most disturbing is you see the, you know, the assaults on Asians, the number of assaults on Asians has tripled. Uh, 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 since the Biden administration has come in, and it was already escalating under Trump. And what that tells us is that violence against Asians, against Chinese, has been normalized. That is to say, you know, you day in and day out, you pour out, you know, hate and hate mongering and threats uh, against Asians. And you do this as a matter of, you know, whole of government policy. Mm -hmm. And some of that is going to trickle down. That wholesale policy is going to trickle down on a retail level. And you're going to see attacks against Asians. And so, you know, for example, I work with an Asian agency. Almost everybody I know has been assaulted, assaulted or threatened in the streets uh, you know, attacks and even killings have just been normalized. Uh, recently, there was a young Hmong uh, girl uh, in her early 20s. Uh, you know, she was chased uh, by a gang of young men. Uh, and then she was gang raped. Uh, and then she was killed. She, she was, I think she was crushed to death. I think she was smashed on the head until, you know, she was crushed and her spine was broken. And as they were doing this, you know, the perpetrator says, uh, said, I love uh, effing uh, these uh, chink, B-I-T-C-E-H-S. You know, so that's the level of hatred that has just become normalized in U.S. culture. You know, it's what's your... It's under the radar. It's, it, it's, it's being, it's under the radar. It's covered up. It's always being, you know, kind of reframed or... You know, it's never classified as a hate crime. But the simple fact is, if you create such extraordinary propaganda in order to manufacture consent for war, in order to manufacture the kind of hatred that is necessary for war, and you, you think that you can just focus it over there, 
but it will also blow back over here. So, you know, my warning to anybody who has Asian friends or family, uh, you know, I just, I, I have to say, you know, we're in a very dangerous time and everybody has to take care and to take care of each other. <clears throat> but mm. sorry, I, I got a little sidetracked there, but, you know, coming back to what I see, <clears throat> what's happening in Korea, you know, Korea and Japan are remilitarizing on an extraordinary level, an extraordinary scale. Uh, you know, they've traditionally been uh, enemies, Korea and Japan, but the U.S. has kind of forced them together in a shotgun wedding. Uh, they're going to bring back the GSOMIA, which is like a three eyes intelligence sharing system, which is to coordinate, among other things, uh, missile defense and missile attacks. Japan has uh, decided to build out its counter-strike capacity, which means uh, its offensive capacity to launch missiles against China. It's buying 500 Tomahawk, and that is just the beginning. It's doubling its military budget, which will make it the third largest military budget on the planet. And it already has the fifth most powerful military. Of course, Korea has the world's largest military manpower that the United States has operational control over, that it controls the South Korean military uh, under wartime, which it can declare any time by declaring DEFCON 3. And so you have Korea, Japan, uh, and the United States also align, aligning now with the Philippines. And so now there's the JAFAS, the Japan-Philippine-US alliance. They're building out four more bases because they're right next to you know, the area where they expect war in Taiwan and also is a chokehold against uh, the, you know, the traffic through the South China Sea, which is another way of destroying China's economy. Uh, and then you see that Taiwan is being packed full of weapons. It's being turned into a porcupine or more accurately, a suicide porcupine that is the United States wants to do with Taiwan Island what it has done with Ukraine, which is to fight to the last uh, Taiwanese. Mm. Uh, and the Taiwanese have just increased the length of their military conscription uh, by threefold. It used to be four months. Now it's a year. Uh, you know, the U.S. has passed the Taiwan uh, Protection Taiwan Policy Act, which they renamed Terra, and then passed it under the NDAA. Uh, and inside that, there are very specific uh, elements that talk about making sure that the Taiwanese fight and that none of their troops defect or are, you know, uh, sympathetic to China, which actually a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, all this uh, stuff around not just, uh, you know, policy, uh, but also uh, plans for, you know, uh, it's just recently been released that the U.S. has plans to destroy Taiwan's semiconductor factories uh, if it ever got into a war. And so you can really see the kind of suicide kamikaze aspect of this, that they really want to use uh, Taiwan as, you know, a, uh, you know, kind of a, a suicide bomber. They're strapping a suicide bomb onto the island without any consent of the, the you know, the will of the people on the island who are mm -hmm. adamantly opposed to that and nobody wants war and everybody wants the status quo, but the U.S. wants to impose this on it. CSIS, which is the Center for Strategic and International Studies, it's a war hawk think tank, uh, just released a war game in which they said that uh, the U.S. Uh, could win a war with China over Taiwan. It would be a Pyrrhic victory, but it would win. And this goes against every other war game that has ever been uh, reported on. The Pentagon did 18 iterations of war games with China, and every single one of them said that uh, the U.S. would lose, and it would lose faster and more, you know, in a more 
devastating fashion each time they ran the war game. But the CSIS war game, very convenient, says that the U.S. will win. And of course, it says that we cannot speak to the effects that would have on the people of Taiwan. That is a political issue. But of course, we know that uh, the people on Taiwan Island would be completely obliterated. They would become cannon fodder. Uh, and so everywhere in all directions, you see this escalation, both in operational, logistical, tactical training, political and, uh, you know, ideological alignment in order to prepare for war. Remember, this war is designed to happen along China's uh, literal waters, it's coastal waters. There's the first island chain that surrounds China, which the U.S. has packed full of bases and weapons like dragon's teeth. It's so dragon's teeth all around China. And then this goes all the way from Japan, uh, Korea, Jeju Island, Okinawa, the islands of Okinawa, Taiwan, which is the centerpiece. And then it goes into the Philippines. And then it... Uh, spins down and goes into the Pacific Islands and goes all the way to Australia. And so Australia has just recently completed its AUKUS Pact, Australia, UK, US, uh, you know, uh, alliance. And on the surface, it looks like it's Australia's plan to uh, purchase three to five Virginia class submarines, nuclear submarines over the next decades. But what it really is, is it's the agglomeration or the consolidation of a, 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 a five eyes or here three eyes, uh, Asian Pacific NATO. And the key element of the AUKUS deal will be for the U.S. to use the port of Perth in Australia as a submarine base with which to launch uh, and to resupply uh, nuclear powered submarines for uh, nuclear warfare. The Australians say, you know, it's not about nuclear weapons. It's just, uh, we just want nuclear powered uh, submarines. But, you know, that's absurd. It's like saying, I'm building a wine cellar, but I'm just going to store, you know, bottled water in it. It's, it that's not how it works. So it's all about having, you know, that's the kind of long duration uh, subsurface threat strategic nuclear subsurface threat against China. And this has to do with what I've explained before is the third offset. China can defend itself. It's spent at least a couple of decades learning how to defend itself with uh, defensive missiles. And it can do that within its territorial waters. The US response against this territorial defense is to disperse its threats, disperse its uh, weapons platforms uh, and its power projection platforms as much as possible. And so that's wh why we have this dispersion, this diffusion uh, all across the first island chain going all the way out to Australia. And the third offset also includes, you know, diffusion, dispersion, swarming, but also it involves automated warfare, AI driven warfare. And it involves subsurface warfare. This, these are the submarines, mm -hmm. as well as electronic coordinated joint, uh, you know, joint uh, operations. And just to make sure, I heard you right. It sounds to me like the people in Taiwan are not supporting their government on this, uh, on what the United States is doing. It doesn't sound like the people in Korea or Japan, South Korea or Japan are supporting their government on this and uh way back when we had a, a an interview with a uh, an ambassador from australia and this must be two years ago when we first heard about AUKUS, and she said that the uh people were not supportive of this so uh, is it true that the governments of all of these countries are doing something the people just are not going along with Yes, absolutely. Well, first, you know, let's look at Korea. Uh, Yoon suk yeol is uh, probably the most unpopular president in Korean his in in Korean history at this time since we started having elections. I think he's in the low 30s, maybe high 20s. Uh every week there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who come out uh, you know, 
protesting, asking for his demanding his resignation because they don't want to be used uh, as uh, a weapon against China for U.S. empire. That's not what they want. It's, you know, it's a complete abdication of Korean sovereignty. Japan has a small but dedicated uh, population, which is strongly opposed to war, and they've been, you know, resisting U.S. Uh, you know machinations at least since the 50s and 60s. But unfortunately, Japan, like Korea, is a client state. Yoon Sagyal is essentially a quizzling puppet of the United States. He's doing anything and everything that pleases the United States to the massive contempt and disgust of his own citizens, but he is doing this because he is such, so deeply, you know, such a deep, uh, deeply compromised uh, in his um, political uh, policies. And the same thing for Japan, you know, I think the Japanese don't want war. Uh, I think they want to bring down this government. Uh, they don't want the massive expenditures, the doubling of the you know military budget, uh, and I think uh, the current Japanese president is is afraid that they may call an election. I think Taiwan is also an interesting case. I mean, which country wants to triple its military conscription? Uh, I mean, who would go for that voluntarily? Uh, I mean, it was uh, you know. I mean, I think it was a given that you know conscription was essentially going to be removed. And so for this government to go ahead and to, you know, um, spend all its money on weapons while its economy is doing so poorly to increase its conscription, all of these things, this was actually put to a referendum. There were several months ago, there were local elections in, you know, in thousands of uh uh, uh, electoral districts. Uh, and these are usually local er elections for electing local officials. officials. But the ruling uh, DPP party said, this is a referendum about China. If you vote for the uh, opposition party, you're voting for China because the opposition party has talked about de-escalating tensions with China. So they said, you vote for them, you're voting for China. And guess what? They all voted for China. So nobody wants this war. Nobody wants this escalation. Vast majority of people on tai Taiwan Island, they just want to get on with their lives. And let's be clear here. Uh, the people on Taiwan Island, they are Chinese. Taiwan is a part of China. It's been officially so at least since the Ming Dynasty, the, uh, the Taiwan constitution says that it's part of China. The U.S. recognizes it as part of China, as a province of China. The U.N. recognizes it as a part of China. Uh, the entire world, except for, you know, a, a half a dozen microstates, all recognize uh, the PRC as the sole legitimate government of China and uh, Taiwan province as part of China. So the U.S. is simply constantly salami slicing, crossing China's red lines. And most recently, which I forgot to mention, is they've decided to send in trainers. Uh, so, you know, right. they've quadrupled the number of U.S. Uh, troops inside Taiwan Island. Again, uh, you know, the fact that they're doing this openly is what is most astonishing. You know, it's like openly saying in a relationship that you're cheating. That means that you know, it's, you know, the divorce is going to happen. And so they're doing this openly and then stuffing it full of weapons. And at the same time, they constantly keep on talking about, quote, unquote, deterring China from attacking. China has no intention to attack Taiwan Island. These are their compatriots, their family members. They're, they consider themselves to be one and the same, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like, you know, you have a house. Uh, and one of your family members uh, has barricaded themselves in their room. And then they're starting to fill their room with guns and weapons. You know, how long can you tolerate this before you decide that is, you know, there's too much risk involved?
How long can you tolerate this before you decide to intervene?、Uh, that's kind of the situation we're at now, and the U.S. is deliberately doing this because it's trying to provoke a war with China over Taiwan, which will automatically bring in Korea、uh, and other forces. And once it does that, then it will use that to wrong foot China, to delegitimate China, to create a binding strategy where the other countries sanction China, very similar to what it has done with Russia in the Ukraine war, which it also provoked.、Mm. So、uh, before we get to、uh, another question comparing Ukraine and Taiwan, or Ukraine and Ukraine, Russia and China. Um, the United States, if I'm not mistaken, signed on to a one-China policy.、And、yes,、so、absolutely. They're now going against that. They're now、um, yes backing away from that. So,、uh, okay. So, in your assessment, then、um, is the situation over China? Which one's most dangerous right now? Which one's got the most immediate danger?、Uh, the Ukraine situation or the Situation over Taiwan. You know,、uh, I think they're dangerous in different ways. You know, in this, you know, in this, you know, murderous time that we are living in, I think it's hard to pick between,、uh, you know,、uh, you know, the terrible things that are happening.、Uh, certainly, Ukraine is a hot war, and we can see, you know, the day in day out, the, you know, the grinding, you know,、uh, military tolls, which are quite, you know, horrific. And you know, I think that speaks to the need for negotiations and de-escalation, which could be done, but the U.S. doesn't want this, and it's you know turning its thumbing its uh, uh, nose at the twelve-point plan that China has put forth. China has good relations with both the Ukraine and Russia, and like Saudi Arabia and Iran, it could be a potential、uh, mediator. But the U.S. dismisses that out of hand because it wants to. Bleed Russia strategically as much as possible.、Uh, I think in the ruling class, I think there are at two minds about this. We know from everything that is being put out doctrinally, strategically, ideologically, that they see the ultimate goal as to、uh, contain and take down China. China is the ultimate goal. China is the threat. Uh, the question for the American ruling elite is: Does the road to China go through Russia? That is, do we do we knock out Russia first, and then do we、uh, attack China from the Pacific and、uh, along the、uh, Western Front, or、uh, do we、uh, do we you know kind of put Russia on、uh, a simmer and you know kind of Come around and take out China, and then take Russia out because you know China is currently the economic support for Russia.、Uh, or do we wage both wars at the same time? I think the ruling elite is trying to figure that out. But what we see is a lot of signals seem to indicate that they believe that they need to pivot to China. That China is the key threat.、Uh, you know, Russia. I think that we have. Russia pinned down enough here. We can just kind of grind the Europeans down, use them to grind Russia down. But in the meantime, we need to switch to China, and this is and of course the U.S. is in a hurry because it wants to do this、uh, before it becomes too weakened. So the U.S. is on a tight timeline. Therefore, constantly tries to attribute this to China. It says, "Well, China is going to invade Taiwan before 2027." And then, you know, General Minahan said, "No, they're going to invade in the next two years before 2025." Everybody, get ready, write your will,、uh, get your affairs in order, prepare to kill and to be killed. You know, this is the general in charge of airlift command, the logistics people. So they're saying that the U.S. seems to be on a very, very tight schedule. It's the U.S. which is in a hurry, but they are very, very determined、uh, to trigger some kind of war、uh, with China. And I think that is, once again, extraordinarily, extraordinarily dangerous and foolhardy. 
but I think they're so deeply committed to it. And I think they're trying to pivot to China. Uh, and I think they believe that they have done enough bloodletting with Russia. Harvey, jump in while I try and catch my breath. Because, <laughs> you know. Well, uh, you dangerous. saw this coming uh, the first time we talked to you a few years ago. So it's it's playing out more or less the way you feared that it would. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I mean, what I'm seeing right now is escalation, escalation, yes. escalation. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, uh, when I say escalation, I'm not simply talking about exercises and alliances. I'm pointing out that the logistics yes. are shifting. They're shifting into war. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those of who are, who are of us who have been in the military, we know that there are two things. You don't listen to the politicians because politicians can go anywhere and they do this for political reasons. But we know that there's a backbone involved. And when we see logistical shifts mm-hmm. and we and when we see shifts in training uh, that, you know, there's a qualitative shift or in a difference in uh, training when you approach war, I, we, we can see these things happening. <clears throat> it's uh i guess it's a form of mobilization mm-hmm. yeah what well, yes you, you mentioned that that uh deadly word provoked because yes. of course we had nothing to do with russia we and the united and nato had nothing to do with uh russia's invasion of ukraine of course not you know, yes. Putin mm-hmm. was totally unprovoked. That's the that's the mainstream media. So, yes. uh, how is the United States going to generate this idea that China was not provoked into doing something? Well, you know, anytime the the war, the U.S. uses the word unprovoked war you know that it actually provoked it right otherwise it wouldn't need the qualifier so specifically how is it going to provoke war this has been pretty uh, mapped out in actually pretty extensive detail the author uh, of uh, the 2018 national security strategy uh, colby uh, Elbridge Colby, you know, wrote a book about uh, how to provoke this war. And essentially what it looks like is you continue crossing China's red lines. Well, what is the red line? Well, the first red line is ignoring the one China policy, right? I mean, this would be like if China were giving weapons and diplomatic recognition to Guam or uh, Hawaii, independence movements in Hawaii or in California. Mm-hmm. I mean, if China were packing, you know, Texas full of Chinese weapons so that it could be independent, which is what the Taiwan Policy Act is. It says it's an act to ensure the sovereignty and independence of Taiwan uh, Island. I mean, that would be, I mean, just that statement right there. Uh, would be an act of war. Well, this is where the U.S. has already gone, and it's packing, uh, you know, Taiwan full of weapons. Uh, so as you continue to do that, then what does China do? Does it just let it happen? Does it let it be turned into, you know, uh, 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 unsinkable aircraft carrier packed full of missiles and strategic weapons a hundred miles away from the Chinese mainland, or does it interdict? Uh, these uh, supplies? Uh, Does it interdict these weapons? Does it do a blockade? All of these things are unknowns, but you can see the potential for escalation and for a trigger uh, for a casus belli. And so I think that is being happening. I think that also uh, most people don't realize it, but there's an extraordinary escalation once again uh, to war uh, around or with North Korea. Right now, as we speak, there are uh, two large exercises happening. Uh, many of these are exercising decapitation, amphibious assault, you know, B-1B bombers with stealth fighter escorts. You know, this is just extraordinary escalation. 
And these exercises have been nonstop uh, since the summer. Uh, they're about 20 times larger or 20 times more intense than what we've had in more recent years. And so all of this speaks to the fact that also uh, South Korea is also going to be a flashpoint and a trigger. And for those of us who understand our history, we know that Korea and Taiwan always come in matched pairs. When Taiwan was originally stolen from China, it was because there was war with China in the Korean Peninsula, the uh, Sino-Japanese War, and Taiwan was stolen as war booty as a result of that. Uh, when the Korean War itself uh, happened, uh, China was trying to take uh, Taiwan back, and it's because the Korean War happened that uh, that the Chinese had to give up on their plans for Taiwan Island. And now, once again, here we have the same situation, Taiwan and Korea, you know, incredible hotspots that are linked historically, logistically, ideologically, politically. Uh, all of this is connected. Uh, you know, there's a, a ruling elite, both in Korea and on Taiwan Island, that are very, very pro-Japanese, that see themselves as practically descendants of the Japanese political class. And so we have that, you know, uh, you know, uh, rhizomatic connection that adds to the level of danger uh, that is being prepared. And then the entire South China Sea is also an enormous flashpoint, and this has been war gamed out explicitly. The U.S. believes that if it starts a shooting war in the South China Sea, it doesn't have to win. Uh, it just has to happen because $5.3 trillion worth of Chinese goods and 70% of China's oil travels through the South China Sea, in particular the Straits of Malacca. All you need to do is mine that or have a shooting gallery there, and trade will stop. Uh, ships will no longer traverse that area. And they believe that, you know, within six months, you could see a 25 to 30 percent crash in China's economy. And so all of this is war gamed out. It's very, very specific. But, you know, I think the way that I, I like to think about it is that, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, when you assess, let's say you're a a clinical therapist and you're assessing somebody's risk of being a harm to themselves or being a harm to somebody else. Well, there's certain, you know, boxes that you check off and you ask, you know, is there a history of this? Yes. Uh, is there, are there certain circumstances or life events that are increasing the likelihood of risk? Yes. Uh, is there ideation? Yes, there's been a lot of ideation. Are there plans? Yes, they're very specific plans. Uh, uh, do, do they have the means? Yes, they have the means. How specific are the plans? Well, the plans involve timing. Uh, in, in fact, they have a deadline to them. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they're all about uh, location. Uh, there is uh, availability. Uh, there is lethality increasing lethality, and their clear preparatory acts. And so I think all of this signals is that, uh, and, and plus, you know, there's the withdrawal and the anger and the recklessness that you see. All of these paint a picture in which things are becoming very, very dangerous. dangerous. And I think, um, I think we have to be mindful of these signals, you know, when you know, we when weapons are being stashed or brandished, uh, you know, you don't wait, you don't excuse it. You know, if you're being choked out, uh, you don't walk away, you run away. You know, this is, they're qualitatively different signals that we're getting right now that let us know that, you know, we are very, very far into this process of war. Good Lord. Well, we've kept you, of course, We've kept you for an hour, and of course, this is, this is always a quick hour mm -hmm. with, with, with you, KJ. Is, is there anything you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say? And Harvey, is there anything you, had a, you wanted to say or ask along the way that you didn't get a chance? 
Well, I was, you know, I, I was just getting distracted by, uh, you know, one particular event without understanding it in the larger context. But I just wondered, from your point of view, what you saw, the how you saw the Saudis, what do they see in this for them to make, to, uh, out, you know, pretty much uh, sabotage the U.S.'s uh, role there and, and their plans? Um, you know, I don't have, you know, a crystal ball into the Saudi, <laughs> uh, you know, leadership. But I think they I think they saw several things on the horizon. Uh, I mean, first, it's always been a conflicted relationship with the West, although they have been, you know, kind of the loyal bulwark, the counter revolutionary force against national liberation movements, against pan Arab socialism, uh, against Baathism, against uh uh, you know, Nasserism, uh, I think that they were reaching kind of the end of their, uh, you know, uh, usefulness, uh, partly because, you know, their importance as oil producers was diminishing as the U.S. was producing more. You could see that there were also tensions around, quote unquote, human rights, which are simply symptoms of further frictions going on. Uh, and then I think the Saudis were also reading the writing on the wall. Uh, I think that, you know, as the leader of the Gulf Cooperation Council, there was, they were building out, and, you know, this has been uh, over a decade, they were building out relations with China through the Belt and Road Initiative. And once again, you know, China has millennia long relations with Iran, and it has almost always had good relations with Iran. Persia, you know, some of the first Jewish communities in China, which go back to the 8th, 9th century, uh, they were originally uh, uh, Persian Jews uh, who settled as traders and businessmen. And then they became what we refer to as the Kaifeng Jews who spent a millennia in China without ever experiencing any anti-Semitism. It's kind of extraordinary. It's actually the only place uh, on the planet, uh, where diaspora Jews did not, were not subject to anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, all this to say that China has a long and, uh, you know, uh, mutual history with Iran or Persia. Uh, and then the Saudis as part of, and the entire Gulf Cooperation Council over the past decade, uh, has been building relations and they want what China offers, which is the development of infrastructure, uh, the development of trade relations, and the development of technology and uh, educational systems, uh, and all of the things that really are about truly developing a country. Their relationship to you know, to the United States was essentially a security relationship. You know, the U.S. gave them quote unquote security it sold them weapons in this massive boondoggle and it took their oil and in return you know there was an agreement to recycle uh, petrodollars into us treasuries and so that was a very kind of thin uh you know interest based alliance and mm -hmm. i believe that the saudi leadership you know thinks farther and deeper than that and they realize that 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 paracolonial relationship ultimately is unsatisfying and not beneficial for them. And they wanted some of the real, uh, you know, benefits that they could get from having a genuine relationship with a uh, burgeoning and growing uh, multipolar system led by China, that is infrastructure development, technological development, uh, and education. I think these are the core things that they were looking at. Well, that, that all makes sense now that you explain it for sure no no wonder to you people in no wonder us in the united states is not getting it it makes sense so <laughs> yes. kj anything that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to touch on well you know i i just want to emphasize that we are in the thick of this escalation uh but that we don't have the option of uh of giving up, you know, I mean, this is such a dangerous moment 
that we have to do everything possible to prevent uh, the outbreak of war. And so that means, you know, uh, working for peace any way and every way that you can. No single individual is able to stop war. But I believe that if enough of us speak out and take action together, uh, hopefully we can steer this uh, bus away from the cliff. And sometimes it's not just, a you know, we may not be able to stop it, but we can steer it away from the edge. And then that gives us a little bit of breathing space to regroup and try and talk some sense, you know, into the ruling imperial elite that are dead set on creating this uh, total global, uh, you know, Armageddon, this catastrophe. And in the meantime, as we do that, if we allow the possibility of alternative systems to strengthen uh, in the global south, then I believe that eventually what that does, is it gives more of the world more choices. And I always say, you know, we want to ensure uh, the choice that allows more choices. And so as new systems and as new uh, pluripolar, multipolar uh, economic and political systems arise, what they do is they have the potential to give hope and perhaps even filter back into, you know, the the imperial core and shift things for us. I I don't believe that you know that the United States is going to have a revolution and that it's going to come to its senses. But I do believe that what we can do is think of first doing no harm, and as we do so, if we allow uh, the global South to come up with its own uh, networks and systems. Uh, then we have the possibility to shift the world into a more stable, beneficial, more just, and peaceful world. And I think that's all we can hope for at this current moment. And so this is the third time you've been on the show, I think. At least. Uh, at <laughs> least, you know, with more to come, I'm sure. We'll have to, we'll have to check in with you um, at least within six months to see if we're here. But let me let me tell you what I think is the most important thing for us is not for us simply to be triggered and then try to, you know, kind of suppress that, but to take that uh, stimulus and to move it into action. And I believe that if we take action, any action, the smallest action, some action, I believe that ultimately that's not only beneficial for the world, because, you know, as I said, multiple acts add up but that it's also just from a personal psychological perspective, that is the thing that is most uh, um, grounding and uh, and uh, salutary for us. I wanted to ask, I think my action that I usually go for first is letters to the editor. Mm. And if you yes. know any uh, that, that, uh, you know, effectively uh, make these arguments. Uh, I'm not beyond plagiarizing, so. <laughs> but otherwise, I'll just try to uh, listen to this show again and summarize a lot of what you've said. <laughs> well, you know, nothing I've said is original, so I mean, <laughs> feel free to go ahead and use it however you see fit. I think everybody should do that, but we just. Yeah have to get the message out yes well, thank you for sure and keep keep hope alive so, absolutely so kj thanks so much again this is march so we'll we will talk to you at least by september so yes <laughs> hopefully with 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 a more optimistic tone that's Never. right that's right yes. all right take thank care you again so much for your time and thank you so much pleasure See ya. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>